Hello, everyone. Welcome to this educational program. I am Patricia Vasconcelos, a board member of the Foreign Press Correspondents Association in the U.S., U.S. and White House correspondents for S correspondent for SBT Brazilian TV Network. Today, we're going to talk about the role of the European Union in the U.S. and China rivalry, a topic that is present in our daily work, reporters in stories that we write for television, radio, internet, newspaper. Our guest is here with us, is Stephen Olson, Senior Research Fellow for Heinrich Foundation. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Um, welcome. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. A, a big thank you to the Foreign Press Correspondents Association for, for organizing today's event. Now, I, I have just a, a couple of uh, slides that I would like to share with you. And I always call one. Whenever yes. I do this, I manage to screw it up about 50% <laughs> of the time. So bear with me and hopefully... <laughs> Just before we start, Stephen, if you, if you could give me uh, five minutes so I can give you, um, I can introduce you properly for our guests. If you, sure. if, if, sure, we, if, if, if it's okay for you, so we can, if we can just pause this light a little bit. And so I can properly um, introduce you for um, our guests. Uh, sure, sure. Many of them. I don't have I am sure I many of them know you because you are a very um, uh, important source and interviewee of many TV outlets. Uh, so Stephen, he's a senior research fellow at Heinrich Foundation. Over the course of his more than 30-year international career, Olson has lived and worked in Asia, the Middle East, and the United States, holding senior executive positions in the private sector, international organizations, government, and academia. He began his career here in Washington, D.C. as U.S. US trade negotiator, serving as a member of the U.S. negotiating team during NAFTA and the U.S.-Canada FTA. Uh, he went on to serve as president of the Pacific Basin Economic Council in Hong Kong. Uh, he after became vice chairman at the Cairo based Article Group and for Investment and Development. He also had visiting professor positions at various uh, universities. In his current position at Heinrich Foundation, Mr. Olson conducts analysis and research on global trade and investment issues, including US-China relations, the global trade architecture and sustainable trade. And as I said here at the beginning, we are talking about the role of the European Union uh, and the US-China rivalry. Stephen is gonna talk about how renewing a united front with American allies to counter China has been a top priority for the Biden administration. The position Europe takes will determine the effectiveness of any US strategy, but while the US and the European Union have had close work and partnership, their interests and viewpoints are far from identical, right? So during this educational program, we will review, we are going to analyze and decode perspectives and priorities of the European Union and the US toward China in terms of how to manage the rise of this um, country. So Stephen is going to start with his presentation. And for our guests who are already connected here with us after this presentation, we are going to open for for um, a section of questions and answers. So all of you who are here with us in this live connection, you could drop your questions through um, the question box so I can um, forward those questions to Stephen. So welcome again and feel free to start your presentation, Stephen. Thank you so much. Great. Well, well, thank you very much, uh, Patricia. Every time I hear someone make reference to, to a 30-year <laughs> career, it reminds me that I'm getting very, very old. So No, none you. of us. We, are, <laughs> we, we gain experience. I must <laughs> point out, I cannot forget, Stephen, that this program is organized by the Association of Foreign Press Correspondents in the United States with the Heinrich Foundation, and the association is solely responsible responsible for the development of the content of this educational program. So let's start. Great. Very good. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, well uh, good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on behalf of the Heinrich Foundation. 
So as, as we discussed, we're going to be talking a little bit about the role, in my, in my judgment, a potentially substantial role uh, that the EU could be playing in the U.S.-China rivalry. Now, of course, uh, President Biden came into office seeking to restore traditional U.S. alliances and confront China more forcefully on strategic, economic, and trade issues. This, this came, of course, on the heels of four years of the Trump administration, in which President Trump sometimes seemed determined to take a wrecking ball uh, to traditional uh, U.S. Uh, alliances, in particular with the EU. Um, some of you will probably remember that, that Trump even went so far as to refer to the EU as, quote unquote, just as bad as China uh, when it came to trade practices. And so uh, a top priority for the Biden administration, literally from, from day one, has been to repair these damaged alliances, in particular with the EU, and construct a more united front uh, to push back more effectively in areas of common concern with China, economically, strategically, and on the trade front. Now, thus far, I would say the, the results of that effort to, to, to repair uh, our relationships and to form a united front has been mixed at best, and it's not really clear to me when or if uh, we might see a significant improvement. Now, I, I think the, the, the focus on the EU is just a, a sensible recognition of the critical balancing role that the, uh, that the European Union plays. An EU that lines up more directly behind some of the more aggressive, uh, forceful U.S. policies would certainly strengthen the, 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 the punch that those policies pack. Whereas an EU that, that, that sits on the fence or, or even more so an EU that tilts in the direction towards China would, would significantly strengthen the ability of China to, to weather the storm with the various policies, restrictions, sanctions, et cetera. And so I, I think we're in a, a somewhat ironic situation in which um, the most important rivalry taking place in the Indo-Pacific region could be significantly impacted by uh, decisions that are, are being taken in Brussels. Now, of course, uh, uh, Europe and, and uh, the United States and most of the countries of Western Europe and then subsequently the European Union have enjoyed a close working partnership for, for the most part, uh, for the better part of three quarters of a century now. Um, but the interests and viewpoints on, on China are certainly not identical. Yes, of course, the U.S. and the EU share a common set of concerns about uh, China's authoritarian system, system of government, its uh, military muscle flexing uh, in the South China Sea, and some of its more predatory trade and economic policies, and, and human rights concerns as well. But uh, despite those differences, despite those similarities, there are significant differences over how best to manage China's rise. Now, the European Union, it seems to me, is trying to th thread a fairly narrow needle. It's trying to maintain robust uh, commercial relationships, strong uh, trade and investment ties with China, while still reserving the right to push back and sometimes push back fairly aggressively when there are concerns about human rights, st uh, strategic issues, or trade and economic issues. The United States, and, and I think for those of you who are based in Washington, you've got a, a front row seat for this. I think uh, the, the consensus now in the U.S., um, sort of assumes the inevitability of a greater disruption in the commercial uh, relationship. Uh, it seems like the U.S. is no longer using the term decoupling, uh, opting instead to, to adopt the term de-risking, but I think really they're, they're, they refer to basically, uh, basically the same thing. Now, the, this whole discussion is, is further complicated by the difficulty we have when we even attempt to talk about a quote unquote European Union viewpoint on China, uh, because there are some fairly divergent voices within the EU. Uh, at, at one end of the extreme, we've got uh, French President Emmanuel Macron, who has been the strongest voice against the EU 
following behind some of the more um, aggressive, some of the more confrontational U.S. policy stances. And Macron has even gone so far as to say uh, that lining up behind the, e the U.S. on these policies would turn the EU into, quote unquote, a vassal state of the United States. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we've got people like European Commission uh, President Ursula von der Leyen and her rhetoric, and in particular, some of her more recent speeches uh, have been very blunt and very direct in talking about the sharp deterioration in EU-China relations and calling out in, again, fairly blunt language, uh, some of the more problematic uh, Chinese, Chinese policies. Now, this, this critical balancing role that the European Union can play, uh, not surprisingly, that, that important role is, is clearly recognized by officials in Beijing. And so Beijing has been pursuing uh, a policy that, that, that makes a fair amount of sense, which is triangulation, um, attempting to the extent possible to split the European Union uh, off from the United States. And so China has made substantial efforts to cultivate stronger ties with the European Union. Now, in, 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 in my opinion, the, the high watermark uh, for these efforts occurred during the waning days of the Trump administration, in which China and the EU reached agreement on what really would have been a landmark comprehensive agreement on investment. Now, at the time the agreement was reached, the election in the US was over. Biden had been elected president, but he had not yet taken office. And so all of his sort of his administration in waiting, the officials who were going to move into senior positions uh, in the Biden administration once they were sworn in, um, all reached out sort of frantically to their uh, uh, European counterparts and they said, look, we've got real concerns about this agreement with China. Please wait, please wait, please wait. Let us uh, officially come into office and we can convey these concerns to you um, in a more, in a more in, uh, under official, through official channels. The European Union uh, and European officials heard these concerns and said, no, we're gonna move forward with this agreement with China. Now, at the time, this, this was seen, and I believe correctly seen, as a major coup, a major victory for China in its efforts to sort of triangulate uh, between the US and the EU, and a major setback for the United States. Um, however, um, uh, the agreement actually hasn't come into force as a result of, of significant, significant acrimony uh, which ensued between uh, China and the European Union over sanctions, over human rights concerns about in, uh, in, in Shenzhen. So the agreement for the time being has never been fully ratified. It's sort of on a side burner in a state of, of apparently uh, permanent limbo and it is uh, presumed dead. Now, even an even greater uh, impediment to a closer relationship between China and the EU has been the war in Ukraine. Now, from the European Union perspective, uh, the war is absolutely cataclysmic. It's an existential threat. It's viewed as, as a threat to the very foundational principles upon which the entire European Union experiment has been based. And so from the perspective in, in Brussels, the only appropriate reaction to the war in Ukraine is strong condemnation of Russia, strong sanctions on Russia and support for Ukraine. Now, of course, China has done none of this. Um, and not, not only have they not joined the sanctions, they've, they've, they've not, only, not only not criticized Russia, they've also expressed the point of view that responsibility for the war lies with the United States uh, rather, than, rather than Russia. And in fact, China has significantly increased its imports um, from Russia of energy and other items, which would either directly or indirectly help fuel the ability of Russia to, to fight the war in Ukraine. And so again, the, the EC uh, uh, 
President Ursula von der Leyen has again in very blunt terms said, look, the, the EU-China relationship is going to be very largely determined by how China responds to what she refers to as Putin's illegal war in Ukraine. Now, if that's the case, that would suggest to us um, uh, that, that relations between China and the EU are going to be at least somewhat strained for the foreseeable future. Now, if, if, if China has not been playing its cards perfectly vis-a-vis -vis the European Union, I think it's fair to say that, that the United States has not helped its case either. The US has not been playing its cards uh, perfectly uh, by any stretch of the imagination. The European Union has been rankled by what it sees as a lack of coordination and a lack of consultation from the United States and a seeming indifference to the collateral damage um, that many of the US's China policies are causing for the European Union. Now, the case in point for this, of course, is the Inflation Reduction Act, which was intended to, um, among other things, help the United States compete more effectively vis-a-vis -vis China in electric vehicles and electric vehicle batteries. And one of the key components of this legislation provides for significant uh, tax incentives for uh, vehicles that or batteries that are assembled either in the United States or importantly, in countries that have a free trade agreement with the United States. Now, of course, the European Union does not have a free trade agreement with the United States. So this means that as a practical matter, uh, European producers would be disadvantaged, not only vis-a-vis -vis US producers, but also vis-a-vis -vis Korean producers, Mexican producers, Canadian producers, producers from any country that has a free trade agreement with the United States. Now, in my opinion, it, it should have been blindingly obvious to US officials that this was going to cause an absolute firestorm in the European Union. But both Congress and the White House either didn't recognize it or didn't particularly care. And so when the legislation was finalized and when European officials became aware of these provisions, they predictably went ballistic, they went through the roof. And so there's been a tremendous amount of scrambling around after the fact uh, damage control to try to patch things up. Now, it looks like they'll have sort of a Band-Aid solution, um, either as a result of reaching an agreement in critical minerals between the United States and the European Union, which would very generously uh, be considered a free trade agreement and let them get access to the tax incentives in that way, or through an implementing regulation which would allow leased vehicles from the European Union uh, to also qualify for the tax break. But I think ir irrespective of that, the, the key takeaway here from the European Union is that this would not strengthen your confidence in your working relationship with the United States when it comes to, 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 to China policy. So can and will uh, the US and the EU um, ever get their act together with regard to China policy? Well, I, I don't think we will ever see a seamless policy. There never has been and there never will be a seamless US, EU, um, China policy. But I guess the real question is, are we going to see a greater convergence or divergence in the US and the EU approach to China? I would suggest to you that, that you, you might see somewhat of a bifurcated response. I, I think you might see a coming together rhetorically. And I think in the G7 statement, you saw um, uh, a fair amount of unity um, uh, rhetorically, but I would encourage you to pay less attention to what is said and what is written down on a piece of paper and pay more attention to what actually happens. Because when it comes time to implement many of these uh, quote unquote unified policies, I think there still might be a fair amount of divergence. In any case, um, uh, we'll see how that plays out. I think though that, that 
if for no other reason than to limit the collateral damage, I think there's a strong rationale here for both sides to, to coordinate and to consult more closely. I'll bring my comments to a close there and I'll, I'll look forward to uh, any comments or any questions that uh, any of you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. I'm going to, again, ask our guests, please feel free to drop your questions or send your questions so Stephen can help us with that. So, uh, Stephen, you wrote in your analysis and you briefly um, talked about here that uh, you said that repairing Bruce relations with the European Union to push back more vigorously, vigorously against China has been a priority for the Biden administration. Xi Jinping has been also very focused in reconstruct those bruised relations you mentioned here uh, in, in your introduction, the, uh, the visit that Macron uh, did to Beijing with Ursula von Leyen. Uh, also, they were together uh, not long time ago. Uh, Ukraine was part of the agenda of that visit uh, that Macron made, but also balancing business ties as well. In this world economic chess game, who is ahead, United States or China? Well, uh, look, in, 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 terms of, in terms of the struggle to kind of get the European Union to tilt in one direction or another, um, I, I don't. I, I think the game has. Uh, I think the game has just begun. I think there are some. I, I would not, however, underestimate uh, the impact of China's stance on the war in Ukraine. I think that that is a very, very uh, significant impediment. And as long as the war drags on, and as long as uh, uh, China continues to maintain its stance, I think that's going to be a very, very, very significant uh, impediment to a closer relationship between the EU and China. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, uh, the, 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 the war uh, in Ukraine, um, do, you, do you believe that in, in any point, in, in, in extension, um, th this war and the way that United States, it's, um, um, it's referring itself and European Union as well, this might affect in some, some point the mutual interest of United States and Europe. Do you, do you believe that there might be a break at some point so that the European Union can clearly pursue the Chinese market? Well, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in the upcoming U.S. election, both in terms of the presidential election and Congress. As those of you who are in Washington are, or probably know much better than I do, um, there have been a number of voices in Congress, primarily but not entirely on the Republican side of the aisle, that are voicing some very, very, very serious reservations about the commitment to Ukraine and in particular the amount of money that the United States is spending um, supplying Ukraine. If there is a, a change in the direction the political winds are, are, are blowing in the United States and there's a, a ramp down in the U.S. commitment to, uh, to supporting Ukraine in this conflict, I think that could spill over into the U.S.-EU relationship because, again, and those of you who, who are European and work for European news outlets, again, you'll know this better than I, from the European perspective, this is this is viewed as nothing. Uh, the war in Ukraine is viewed as nothing other than an existential um, uh, threat requiring maximum support for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. As you referred to the U.S. election, someone asked, uh, as the House just passed the tablet limit bill uh, at, and uh, this agreement in between Biden and Kevin McCarthy, uh, some cuts uh, regarding how the United States, how the government is going to spend its, mo spend its money. So uh, could you address more about uh, how the, the, the new policy of this U.S. administration might change regarding this new reality, regarding its internal economy and uh, the war in Ukraine, how much money they are putting there? I, I think a lot of it depends on, well, let, let me say this. My, my understanding is of the agreement that was reached between uh, Biden and uh, House Speaker McCarthy is that there will continue to be increases for defense funding 
presumably that means there'd still be the money uh, available to uh, support the war effort in Ukraine. Now, the fact that the money is at least potentially there does not mean that necessarily the political will uh, will will also be there, and particularly if if we see in the upcoming election uh, Republicans gaining control of both houses of Congress, let alone the White House. Mm-hmm. Do you believe that the the the, the, the Biden administration can change some? Uh, policies in the course of the, the Biden's campaign for the re-election, and this something that might affect the relation with the European Union, or it's too soon to project that or predict that. Well, I'll I'll answer the question by expressing a hope. I I, I would hope that 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 one takeaway uh, for the Biden administration would be that a, a bit of additional consultation goes a very long way. I mean, this this major blow up we had over the Inflation Reduction Act, from my point of view, was entirely a a self-inflicted wound. I I was shocked that this wasn't foreseen, uh, the problem that this created, and the the, the damage that it potentially could do to the the, the confidence of the EU in their ability to work uh, constructively with, with the Biden administration. I'll add, I'll add two additional thoughts. I, th- I, I think also that there are a lot of people in the European Union that are, are watching the polls, even though we're still two years out from the next presidential election. They're, they're keeping their eyes on the, poll, on the polls, and they're seeing that Donald Trump continues to have a substantial lead on the Republican for the Republican nomination. And so I think there's got to be at least some tendency to worry about well, uh, we, we, we have a very clear picture of the stance that, that President Trump uh, in his previous, during his previous administration took towards the European Union. And if there's a possibility that we could end up with another four years of Trump, I, I think that could also uh, be influencing uh, how at least some in the European Union are viewing their cooperation with the United States. Mm -hmm. A question here about South Korea. The South Korean president, uh, he was here in Washington, D.C. in a state visit not long time ago. He spent a full day with President Biden at the White House, including a state dinner um, at the end of that day. Uh, Can South Korea be an option in order to decrease American and European dependence on China's products? Well, I'd say a couple of things about, uh, about Korea. Korea, I think, is is a very interesting case, and in a lot of respects, in a in a very similar situation uh, uh, to the uh, to the European Union. There are very, very, very strong economic ties uh, between uh, uh, between China and Korea, but yet a very, very strong strategic and security uh, relationship. And so, I think uh, Korean politicians. Are in a very delicate, uh, are playing a very uh, delicate balancing act to try to maintain the uh, the, the very cooperative relationship uh, with the United States, both on a security and economic basis, without doing anything to to jeopardize uh, uh, the relationship the relationship with China. In terms of Korea ever being able to sort of uh, re- replace the European Union in terms of the economic uh, relationship with the United States. I don't think under any case, even uh, even under the case, I don't think there's any set of circumstance in which we'll see a dramatic uh, rollback in the U.S. European Union economic relationship. I think that's I think that's steady. I think that's secure. And even if the two countries do not, if, if both the United States and the European Union do not see eye to eye on a more unified China policy, I don't think that I don't see that impacting or decreasing the the, the strong economic and trade relationship and the high degree of integration that exists between the U.S. and the EU. Mm-hmm. Well, in this educational program, we are focusing on the United States and Europe and how those uh, this relation can affect both relations with China. But there are also other, you know, uh, elements and players in the world. BRICS, for example, China, Brazil, India, South Africa and Russia, right? Countries part of this group, as Brazil, for example, showed 
a huge interest in repair broken relations uh, with China. The Brazilian president, um, just after Macron, he also visited uh, uh, Beijing, uh, showing um, a strong interest from both um, the South American country and also from the Chinese um, country. Um, what are the implications from your perspective to the US and Europe regarding this approach of China towards South America called by Xi Jinping as a new era? I'm saying that because I was there in that coverage and while both presidents, they were walking, uh, uh, the, the, the Chinese government sh uh, chose a, a music, uh, a Brazilian music called a new era while they were walking. So what might be the implications for United States and Europe? I, I think the visit was extremely, uh, extremely important. It, it, it highlighted the fact that although from, from the US and the European Union perspective, the, the, the war in Ukraine is an immensely high priority and requires a very strong response. But we see a lot of countries, and in particular, you mentioned the BRICS, um, uh, uh, Brazil, India, other countries are being much more agnostic. Other countries are, are uh, uh, being much more neutral in the conflict. And I and even get a little bit indignant at the suggestion that it should be as important to them as it is to the European uh, Union. I forget who it, uh, who it is. It might have been someone in Brazil, it might have been somebody in South Africa, but a line that has been uttered many, many times is that the European Union thinks that European problems are global problems, but that global problems are not the European Union's problems. And I think there's been this, this, this schism uh, where uh, a lot of countries, uh, the, the BRICS countries in particular, um, uh, uh, feel that there is not insufficient, that there's insufficient attention on the problems directly impacting them, but an assumption that there's got to be a great degree of interest in a war taking place in Europe. So I think I, I, I think China has an opportunity to sort of um, uh, play into uh, this dissatisfaction in, in Brazil and other countries that share a, a similar uh, viewpoint and don't view the war in Ukraine as an ex existential crisis to the same extent that uh, that the European Union does. So I think the Lula visit was very significant. Mm -hmm. So we should not see as a threat or um, a, a clear uh, division among, you know, um, uh, regions in the world. Oh, now China, they, they are facing Latin America or maybe India. So can all those forces, economic uh, agreements coexist in a, in a healthy way? Well, here's, here's what I would say. I think, I think most countries in the world don't wish to get dragged into this strategic rivalry between the United States and China. They, they assess, and in most cases, I think correctly so, that their, their national best interests are served by maintaining robust commercial ties, both with the United States and China and avoiding any kind of a tilt one way or the other. And so I, I think we are seeing a large group of countries uh, kind of uh, trying to remain in that, in that middle ground as the US-China rivalry uh, intensifies, despite the efforts of the United States to get more countries to tilt in its direction, and despite the efforts of China to get more uh, countries to tilt in their directions. For most of these countries, and I think it's especially true in ASEAN, I think this, this plays out in particular in ASEAN, their best interests are maintained by avoiding a definitive tilt and maintaining robust ties with both the US and China. Mm -hmm. Focusing in, in the European Union itself, um, you talked here at the beginning about the divergent voices within the European Union, and you mentioned the, the Macron visit, and the Ursula von Leyen as well visit, but could you um, give us other examples that might uh, explain uh, this concept of divergent voices within the European Union? There, there's a couple of important countries I, I think we have to keep, a lot, keep, keep our eye on. Um, it, Germany is one of those. Now, of course, a Angela Merkel, Angela Merkel, at least in perception, 
put business first in the relationship uh, with, with China, often to the frustration of the United States. Uh, uh, German, uh, particularly uh, the German automotive industry um, uh, has tremendous, de derives a very significant portion of their global revenues and profits from China. And uh, Ang Angela Merkel put a high priority on, on maintaining close ties, not rocking the boat in deference, uh, not rocking the boat with China in deference to the strong commercial ties that, that so many German companies uh, have. Now, her successor, Olaf Scholz, I don't quite have a handle yet personally on where he's coming from. He, he sometimes uh, 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 seems to uh, engage in rhetoric uh, that suggests a, a more harder line stance and a bit of a divergence from the policies of his of Angela Merkel, his predecessor. Yet there are some decisions that are being taken, particularly with, with, with leasing of some port facilities uh, that seem more in line. So I don't, I, I personally do not have a clear take on the extent to which Germany is going to, and Ola, under Olaf Scholz will follow that more business first attitude that Angela Merkel took, or whether we'll see sort of a tougher, a tougher stance out of Germany. The other country that's, in, that's interesting to, to keep an eye on, I think will be Italy. Um, Italy was the only G7 member to sign on for the Belt and Road. Uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Now the current administration seems to be reviewing whether or not uh, they want to continue with that or whether or not they want to pull out. I think that will be an important bellwether to keep an eye on to see which way Italy might tilt. Mm -hmm. The war in Ukraine, it's a topic which a huge interest. Um, um, how big is the is the is the patience in among a European Union countries toward China, who um, promote itself saying that it's neutral in the conflict, although as you mentioned here, showed uh, an inclination toward Moscow, right? Um, how far it, it, do you believe it can go this diplomatic relation among European Union countries and China while saying, no, let's wait, the, uh, Xi Jinping is neutral in this conflict, or um, how far this can go, this, this, this diplomatic acceptance of this, this, this speech of neutrality? Yes. Well, well, look, I, I, I think at least in terms of the realists in the European Union, I don't think anyone is realistically expecting a significant change in policy on the part of, of, of China. After making their stance so clear, I don't think anybody, I don't think there should be any realistic expectations that China's stance is going to change and that it's going to start coming down uh, uh, harder on, on Russia. I think the hope, at least among some in the European Union, and I, I suspect this is probably the case uh, uh, with, with President Macron, is that China uh, can somehow play a constructive role in bringing the war to an end. I think, I think if, if, if China can do that, I think that that will um, provide diplomatic coverage for many in the European Union to main, maintain you know, robust and constructive uh, commercial ties. But I don't think anyone's realistically expecting China to adopt a position uh, more in line with the European Union position on the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. You mentioned here that the US has not helped its case. Uh, US has not helped its case regarding this whole situation and also mentioned the, the G7 meeting saying that we should take more, uh, act, uh, more, pay more attention, we journalists and society uh, in actions rather than what they signed there in those meetings. But do you see any uh, progress in, uh, that was achieved uh, among in that um, meeting, the G7, that you could highlight regarding US and European Union uh, trade relations? Yeah, yes, I do. I, I, th I think if there's one um, uh, specific outcome from the G7 meeting that I think has at least the potential to be one area of sort of concrete achievement will be the efforts to uh, work together more closely on economic coercion. Economic coercion takes place when um, uh, 
China, although China was not uh, specifically referenced by name, the language in the G7 communique was clearly targeted at China and China's uh, propensity to engage in economic coercion. So for example, when Australia uh, had the audacity, had the temerity to suggest that it would be useful to find out what the origins of COVID were, Mm -hmm. China responded by taking a number of uh, trade actions against, uh, against, uh, against Australia. So there have been historically cases where when a country takes a move that is not, uh, that's geopolitically um, uh, uh, displeases China, that China frequently responds with various uh, uh, trade and economic sanctions, otherwise known as, as economic coercion. Now, the, the U.S. and the European Union view on this, I think, is, is, is fairly similar, which is when countries are, 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 are subjected to this form of economic coercion, we have to try to help them weather the storm. So, uh, again, an example, if, if so, if there was a more coordinated response to economic coercion uh, in place when Australia got hit by the sanctions, Hypothetically, you'd see something like this play out. Australia, why, Australia has a very robust wine industry, as many of you know, and China had been a, a leading wine export market uh, for those Australian wine producers. And then as a result of the, the, the sanctions and the tariffs that were put in place, uh, Australian exports dropped off dramatically, causing a lot of pain and suffering for, for the Australian wine industry. If there had been a more coordinated response mechanism in place at that time, the United States, the European Union could have made a concerted effort to purchase more of that Australian wine and thereby limit the, the economic harm and strengthen the ability of the country that's being subjected to the economic coercion to weather the storm. If there's one outcome from the G7 that I think probably has the best prospects to really produce some, some tangible work, I think it's the pledges to work together uh, on, on economic coercion. Oh, so it's accurate to say that United States, European Union, they agree that economic coercion work or might work globally. No, we are not, we are, and we are not talking only about China. So is it accurate to say that? Yeah, yeah. So, so to be clear, this was not targeted to China. It was, it was referenced uh, generically, although reading between the lines, we understand that both the EU and US officials have been uh, strongly critical of China for those instances in which China has engaged in economic coercion. Okay, Sipan, we're uh, driving tower to the end of this program. Um, I have here a question I think that might close our uh, our discussion. Uh, it's a question that you, you also pointed out, but if you could address this for us at the end, do you believe that can United States and European Union get their, their act together? <laughs> here, here's what I'd say. In terms of an of a absolutely seamless policy, no. I, I don't think so. I think you will see at least initially a, con a rhetorical convergence, uh, a, a reflection of being united in terms of what their objectives are. But when it comes to operationalizing a lot of these agreements, it's going to be the devil always lies in the details. Both the European Union and the United States are in agreement that they need to de-risk, and that's understood to uh, to mean to engage uh, 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 less in critical supply chains that are based in China. But in terms of how that actually happens, there's going to be a lot of disagreements. The devil always lies in the details. So I think- Can you, can you think, develop more about this concept? I'm very curious about when you say that the devil, the devil always lies, you're, you're not thinking in, of, of course, one particular um, 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 country, but uh, if you could give an example that would, wouldn't harm- Sure, anyone. <laughs> sure. So, so look, it's, it's very easy at the level of presidents and prime ministers to okay. say that we're in full agreement, we need to de-risk our trade in strategic materials and strategic products. Okay, fine. Complete agreement, complete unity, complete convergence on that. Okay, 
But then when you operationalize it is where you see the disagreements. So what exactly is a strategic material? You want to uh, restrict trade in some semiconductors, but not other semiconductors. And one party says, well, we think here's our list of what we consider to be strategic materials or strategic products that we need to de-risk. And other countries are going to have different viewpoints and say, no, we disagree. We don't think um, this product, this product, or that product should be included. And so it's relatively easy at the level of prime minister and president to have this nice sounding uh, unified position on the need to de-risk in critical materials and critical products, but mm -hmm. you can still run into a lot of disagreements over precisely which products are critical, which are strategic and which are not. Mm -hmm. No, and uh, a question here that appeared, uh, we spoke about this, I believe, in, in another moment, the WTO, right? And um, you mentioned one once that, that, that the way that the world is, 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 is doing its, its business changed completely and the role of the World Trade Organization, it's not as important or is the, it's not um behaving or the action, it's not the way that it should be. So in this perspective of uh, this balance among United States and European Union, are they playing um, an accurate role in order to make the WTO useful? It's, it's an interesting and an important question. Um, I think there's a, there's a somewhat different viewpoint uh, between the United States and the EU on the role of the WTO, and that is further complicating the establishment of this united front, uh, mm -hmm. this potential united front. The European Union seems to be more committed to saying, hey, let's try to find a way to make the WTO work. We know there are problems, we know there are challenges, but let's really roll up our sleeves, get in there. We still think the WTO can play a critical role. Let's work together to solve these problems. Mm -hmm. To one degree or another, and the, the US policy seems to suggest that they've accepted that the WTO is more in the background, at least for the foreseeable future. They're, they're, they're still, the US will continue to be, be engaged in efforts to reform the WTO, but the United States seems to be proceeding, despite its rhetoric, where it reiterates the importance of the WTO, its policies seem to suggest that it's accepted that the WTO is going to be more in the background and play less of a relevant role, whereas the European Union um, uh, seems determined to help ensure that the, that the WTO is really front and center in resolving some of these issues. I think this difference in viewpoint between the US and the EU over the role or the potential role of the, of the WTO is part of the reason we're seeing some difficulty in, in forming this United Front. Some of our, our viewers, journalists here uh, watching us, they want to develop more of this story. For example, I think it should be helpful, for example, to. Uh, how can we explain or for which reason United States would might want to leave the WTO in this background? And is this a matter of uh, in a specific administration, this administration, or this was happening during the previous administration as well? Is it something oh. recent and why is this happening? Well, look, for, let, let, let's first be clear that the United States was the driving force behind the establishment of the WTO and has historically been a, one of the most, the strongest uh, supporters and advocates. I think where we are now reflects a, a regret, a conclusion that many people regret that, that the WTO is just no longer fit for purpose, that its, that its rule book is hopelessly out of date, and because the WTO operates on a consensus basis where you need 164 out of 164 members to really take any kind of uh, significant decisions, I don't think there's much hope that the WTO can move quickly enough or be reformed quickly enough to, uh, to be a key player in solving some of the challenges 
that we're facing today and that we're facing for the foreseeable future. I think from the point of view of most trade officials, most policy officials in the United States, they're not happy about this. I think it's, I, I, I think they regret it, but I think there's a recognition that while the US will remain engaged in efforts to reform and repair the WTO, that they've got to proceed on a, on a, on a basis outside of WTO channels to address the very real issues that we've got to confront today because the WTO just won't move fast enough and the WTO reform process just won't move fast. Mm -hmm. If you have time just for another question uh, here, who is the, from your perspective, who is the main ally of uh, Xi Jinping today in the Western world? Ah, in the Western world, it's, it's, a, really, uh, it's, it's a really interesting question. Uh, look, I, I, I think this, after this, it, it, this reality does not exist. <laughs> well, I, I, I think the word ally might, might, might be a little bit too strong. Too but strong. I think, I think in, you know, in particular, after his recent visit uh, to China, I think within the European Union, I think, I think France, well, uh, the, the way I would, I would phrase it is, I, I'm not sure if I would use the, the word ally, but I think the, the, the key power broker, the, the key influential figure within the European Union, who is most likely to advocate for policies that would align with China's interests, I would say would be, would probably be uh, President Macron. Okay, and now looking in that region, can we use the word ally to say who is more aligned <laughs> with Xi Jinping uh, um, in his region? in order to, to help his interests, his economic interests? Well, look, I, I, think, I think if you look at all of ASEAN as, as a region, China long ago displaced the United States as, as the most important uh, uh, trade, commercial, investment partner in the region. So I, I think, you know, despite some, some fairly nettlesome uh, outstanding boundary disputes, I think the ASEAN region as a whole recognizes the, the economic importance of China. The, the comment I hear again and again when I talk to uh, officials out here is China isn't going anywhere. China is a fact of life and we've got to, uh, we've got to deal with uh, China. So I think, there's, I think there's a strong recognition of that in ASEAN and I think their policies reflect that. Mm -hmm. And how uh, important or how strong is the, the, the topic of technology and uh, spies that, you know, this this topic that involves a lot of um, um, uh, reports that we write about, you know, uh, about the spies balloons uh, here in the United States, uh, this country considering to ban TikTok, that it was banned uh, in the um, cell phones from um uh, people that work for the government, but not in the whole country. But it, this is a, a topic that it's it's still going on here in the United States. Can this? How can this affect um, U.S. trade relations um, with China? And if this affects e European Union as well? It's. It would be hard to put your finger on a, on a single issue that's probably going to be more important in the in the trade and economic relationship. Mm -hmm. We're we're living in an era of technological advances in which the number of products which have dual use capabilities, products that can be used either uh, for consumer uh, for consumer use or can be used for 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 military or other strategic purposes. Uh, is, 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 is growing uh, seemingly day by day. That reality creates either the rationale or, or the pretext uh, for additional uh, levels of, of, of uh, export restrictions. So I think this is an important area. It's gonna grow in importance. And again, it's an area where we could see some divisions of viewpoint between the US and the European Union on how, um, uh, what products these restrictions should be placed on and how strenuous and how onerous these, uh, these restrictions should be. The US National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, in a, in a speech I'm sure all of you followed closely a few weeks ago, referred to, uh, in terms of these technology restrictions, referred to the need to keep a small yard 
with a very high fence in okay. terms of these technology products that you're trying to keep out of China's hands. Now, that's a very useful analogy because there are going to be a lot of disagreements between the United States and the European Union over exactly how big or small that yard should be and exactly how high or low that fence should be. Do you see European Union countries as much concerned as United States regarding uh, uh, technological insecurity, concerns about data, um, um, and those concerns always, uh, they are involved regarding apps or um, companies that comes from China. So do you see European Union countries as much concerned as United States regarding um, products that comes from China? I, I think there's, I think there is a, a similar level of concern, but whether or not the concern within the European rises, within the European Union rises, completely to the level in the United States, I'm not sure. Um, the United States is in a, in a fairly unique, a unique position here as sort of the, the sole remaining uh, superpower and an Asia Pacific nation. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the perspective in the European Union and the perspective in the United States is always going to be a, a little bit, is, is always going to be a little bit different for those reasons. You think, can, can this be solved among um, uh, United States and China directly? What, what, what it seems like it's, it's a, a crossfire of accusations, right? Uh, the, the, this country accusing U.S. Uh, companies of spying or or um, using tools and apps in order to, to reach data from citizens and um, occasionally data from uh, US government institutions. Can this be solved from your perspective in a not diplomatic way, but in, in, a, in a political level, uh, in talking about this broad in a more broader level? Well, I, th I think you used the right phrase. I, I think it is kind of a crossfire of, uh, of accusations. Um, in terms of, of, of whether or not they can work it out, that I'm not sure about, but they've got an obligation to the citizens of their own countries and the citizens of, of countries around the world to try to find, they're, they're never going to reach 100% agreement mm -hmm. and they're never going to see things completely eye to eye. I think the obligation they have to themselves and others is to establish some type of a workable modus vivendi, a, some type of a framework where they can cooperate, where they can cooperate and where they can ensure that disagreements don't blow up uh, out, of, out of proportion. I think at a minimum, uh, they have an obligation to, to, to try to establish that type of a framework, that, that type of a modus vivendi to better manage these issues. And as the Biden administration says frequently, to put some guardrails into the relationship. Okay, Stephen Olson, thank you so much. Anything you'd like to add? Any tip or any idea for <laughs> our guests? We have so many reporters uh, also watching us and they, they would be pleased if you could add something. I don't know, an idea for a story that we, we could develop from here that everything that we spoke about, so many, so many topics. Well, well, look, here, here's what I would say. Well, first of all, a big thank you uh, <laughs> both to the Foreign Press Correspondents Association and to all the, all the people who joined us. I, I'd say, look, please don't regard this as a one-off. Use me as a resource. Feel free to stay in touch with me, connect with me on, on LinkedIn, Twitter, all of that stuff. And if you want to, certainly come to me if you have specific questions, but even if you just want to kick around some story ideas, I'm very happy, very amenable to doing so. And we can talk on the record, off the record, whatever the case might be. So please take advantage. I'm, I'm here. I, I, I view a big part of my job as engaging uh, with the media. So a very sincere invitation. And I, I hope you all uh, take me up on that.
Okay, thank you so much, Stephen Olson, Senior Research Fellow of Heinrich Foundation. Thank you very, very much for join joining us today. We spoke here in this educational program about the role of the European Union in the US-China rivalry. This program is organized by the Association of Foreign Press Correspondents in the United States in partnership with the Heinrich Foundation. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye.